All right, it looks like we've got almost everyone here, so we will uh, kick off this session. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Allison Sayas, and I am a Gynoc Fellow at Northwestern. Um, for this session, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Daniela Matei, the Chief of Reproductive Sciences in Medicine and a medical oncologist who specializes in gynecologic oncology here at NM. Dr. Edward Tanner, the Chief of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology and a gynecologic oncologist here at Northwestern Medicine, and Karen Novak, a nurse practitioner in gynecologic oncology at Northwestern. Together, they will be uh, discussing updates in ovarian cancer treatment. Throughout the session, please feel free to submit questions or comments in the chat. And when they wrap up with their presentation, then we'll transition to more of an open question and answer session that I'll facilitate. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Alison, for um, moderating this session. And thank you, all the participants, for attending. Um, also, uh, thank you to Dara and Anne for putting together this great program. Um, it's my pleasure for the next 15 minutes to uh, review some of the new literature referring to PARP inhibitors. And I guess I uh, drew the lucky uh, draw uh, for uh, today's uh, uh, session because we have a lot to talk about PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer. I will start with the basics. Uh, what is actually PARP? We're talking a lot about PARP inhibitors, but what is PARP? PARP is an enzyme that uh, plays an important role in repairing the DNA in any normal cell or cancer cell during the process of uh, division of the cell, the DNA can break as you can, um, sorry, as you can see here, if the DNA uh, is broken, the cancer um, cannot uh, replicate and will die. So this uh, enzyme uh, is attracted to the areas of breaks in the DNA and repairs the DNA. Um, joins uh, 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 the strands of DNA that had uh, been broken. In, um, when we use an inhibitor for the enzyme, uh, then uh, uh, the DNA cannot be repaired and the cancer uh, uh, cell will uh, uh, die. So we've heard about uh, multiple PARP inhibitors. In fact, uh, these are small molecules. Their structure is a little bit similar, but also dissimilar. There are three PARP inhibitors that have been approved uh, for ovarian cancer, Olaparib, Rucaparib, Niraparib. Uh, there is also Veliparib, which is not currently approved, but has been tested in ovarian cancer, uh, as well as Talazoparib, which is a, a potent PARP inhibitor uh, that uh, is approved for breast cancer. So uh, these chemicals actually have been discovered uh, some time ago. They are not that new, but they were sitting on a shelf because they didn't have a lot of uh, activity uh, in cancer cells. Until a breakthrough discovery about 15 years ago, uh, when um, it was observed that in cancer cells that were normal, these drugs had some activity, but only at very high concentrations. But surprisingly, in cancer cells that had a BRCA mutation, these cancer cells died uh, uh, readily when treated with very low doses of this uh, inhibitor. I think this is the precursor of Olaparib. This was published uh, about 15 years ago and it was a, a big um, a breakthrough uh, at the time. And if you look at the cancer cells under the microscope, you can see that the cancer cells that have an intact BRCA, uh, these are their chromosomes, they kind of look normal when you treat them with the PARP inhibitors, but in the BRCA mutated uh, uh, cells, this uh, drug causes the uh, complete um, DNA uh, failure, like a chaos in the genome. You can see that these uh, uh, um, chromosomes kind of are, are broken up and these cells cannot survive. Um, this process, we refer uh, to it in uh, medicine as the, the concept of synthetic lethality. Uh, the PARP enzyme typically repairs the DNA. Uh, when you inhibit the PARP enzyme, uh, the cells still have a second a mechanism through which they can repair the DNA. And this mechanism is based on the BRCA genes. So when you apply the PARP inhibitor and the BRCA genes don't function, 
uh, the replication fork, the DNA fork that allows uh, the cells to uh, proliferate, uh, this fork collapses and the cancer cells will die. <coughs> and you'll hear a little bit more about this from Dr. Tanner when he explains this process of uh, deficiency of uh, homologous recombination. Because of these uh, discoveries that initially started in the laboratory, we have been able to bring this to the clinic. And over the past uh, five or six years, we have uh, um, uh, you know, enjoyed uh, the approval by the FDA of uh, three different um, uh, um, PARP inhibitors, Olaparib, Rucaparib, and Niraparib, uh, which were approved initially for um, resistant recurrent cancer, then for sensitive recurrent cancer, and more recently for the upfront treatment uh, of ovarian cancer, uh, Olaparib with Bevacizumab and Niraparib alone. Uh, this may seem a routine uh, uh, to you because we've had so many approvals over the past two, three years, but it is a moment of celebration because we had Previous to the approvals of the PARP inhibitors, we only had three drugs approved for um, ovarian cancer over a period of 20 years. And uh, the new drug approvals follow uh, decades of basic science as well as clinical research. Um, the approval of PARP inhibitors and their furious entry in the clinical arena give us uh, a reason to celebrate and to really hope um, that we will have the opportunity to someday cure this disease. I will now go in, not in a lot of detail, uh, but over uh, the studies, the landmark studies that led to the approval uh, uh, and the benefit that the PARP inhibitors um, have uh, uh, demonstrated for patients with ovarian cancer. I will not discuss them chronologically, but rather by uh, context and line of treatment. For the BRCA mutated tumors that represent 10 to 15% of all ovarian cancer, uh, the SOLO1 trial uh, tested Olaparib after standard treatment with surgery and chemotherapy as a maintenance strategy versus placebo. In oncology, we like to look at these survival curves where curvologist, the bigger the difference between uh, the treatment and the control arm, the higher the benefit. And as you can see here, Olaparib uh, really distances itself from the placebo arm. And you can see that at almost at four years, more than half of the patients that uh, took Olaparib maintenance are still alive, which I'm sorry, are still alive and without disease, which makes us hope that some of these patients may actually be cured and that a cure would be possible for BRCA mutated tumors. Um, another study which had a similar design uh, using Olaparib or placebo after uh, carboplatin-based treatment for recurrent uh, platinum-sensitive ovarian cancer, again, shows a big difference in this uh, um, uh, progression-free survival curves between Olaparib and placebo. Uh, and this is for Olaparib. Um, but the other PARP inhibitors also are very uh, active. Uh, this is data for Rucaparib. Looking at patients with BRCA mutated tumors, uh, we call this a waterfall plot, which measures the amount of the decrease in tumor uh, after treatment. And you can see here that vast majority of patients, only a small minority of BRCA mutated tumors actually didn't go below zero. Um, most of them uh, had a response to treatment. And this is for patients with a recurrent, both platinum sensitive and platinum resistant ovarian cancer. And lastly, Niraparib, the third PARP inhibitor, uh, tested in a very similar fashion as a maintenance after a platinum-based therapy in recurrent disease, um, you can see a huge difference uh, in the survival curves of patients that receive niraparib uh, versus placebo. We usually uh, rejoice when we see a small separation of the curves, but this is really uh, a remarkable, a remarkable result. Um, lastly, um, uh, 
Could we use uh, PARP inhibitors instead of chemotherapy? This study, uh, SOLO3 study, lo looked at patients with BRCA mutated recurrent platinum sensitive um, um, cancer, uh, and patients were randomized to standard chemotherapy versus Olaparib. The green curve is Olaparib. You can see that patients that took this really targeted treatment for their mutation uh, uh, did better than patients treated with um, uh, chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy. So this is all great news for the BRCA mutated tumors. But as I mentioned, BRCA mutated ovarian cancer only represents 10 to 15% of all cases. How about the rest of the cases? Um, well, it turns out that um, if you look at uh, mutations among genes that also play a role in DNA repair, which are not the BRCA genes, but other genes, ATM, ATR, MC, RAD51, Fanconi uh, anemia uh, genes. Uh, if you add them all together, they come up to represent about 50% or more of all ovarian cancer. And all these tumors that have a def defect in one of these genes are potentially uh, sensitive uh, to PARP inhibitors. So is that so? Well, if we look at the uh, other patients, not the BRCA mutated patients, of in the previous studies that I uh, discussed, Olaparib, uh, again, uh, improves progression-free survival, maybe not as dramatic as in the BRCA mutated tumors, but the separation of the curve, uh, curves is still impressive. Likewise for Niraparib, uh, as maintenance in the recurrent uh, setting, big separation between uh, 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 the survival curves in all comers. If you uh, uh, furthermore uh, look um, in at the specific tumors that have a deficiency in this homologous recombination, and I will uh, refer to Dr. Tanner's talk that is coming next. Uh, you see again a separation between the curves that resembles that that we uh, we saw for the BRCA mutated uh, tumors, and this actually holds up even for patients uh, in the upfront treatment that were treated with niraparib versus placebo. The separation is not as great as we saw for the BRCA mutated tumors, but still there is a, a, a progression-free survival advantage, which led to the approval of niraparib in this uh, setting. Um, so there are some uh, big questions in the field. Can we predict those patients who will respond to PARP inhibitors? Obviously patients with uh, mutated BRCA1 and 2 tumors will respond. Uh, perhaps patients with mutations in other genes that uh, regulate DNA uh, damage response as, we, uh, as I presented. Uh, there are also um, uh, other uh, sort of um, molecular abnormalities that are not mutations. We refer to them as epigenetic changes. And when these epigenetic changes can um, alter um, same genes involved in DNA repair, those patients also might be responding uh, to PARP inhibitors. Homologous recombination deficient tumors. Uh, typically, uh, there is an overlap between response to PARP inhibitors and response to platinum. Platinum sensitive tumors will uh, respond. Um, research is ongoing and uh, sorely needed to find uh, the best biomarker to identify those patients who respond. Uh, and some, uh, I'll present you some of the, this uh, research uh, looking um, in a trial that used Rucoparib. Uh, patients were divided in BRCA mutated tumors, uh, biomarker negative tumors, and biomarker positive tumors. And I assume Ed will talk about this biomarker. But if you divide the patients by the, in these three subgroups, you can see that the BRCA mutated patients do the best the biomarker positive, the, uh, and the biomarker is a measure of the homologous recombination deficiency do intermediately, and those that are biomarker negative benefit the least uh, from the PARP inhibitor. So who does not respond to PARP inhibitors? Um, there are instances where new mutations can occur in BRCA or RAD51, which make tumors resistant. Uh, treatment with uh, PARP inhibitors sometimes leads to an escape mechanism, another growth pathways that can stimulate the cancer uh, growth. 
um, there have been recent um, uh, uh, advances in finding uh, uh, loss of uh, new DNA repair mechanisms that have not been known uh, about uh, that also can contribute to resistance or perhaps drug efflux mechanism when the PARP inhibitor is actually pumped out outside of the cell. This is an area of utmost research, uh, interest for uh, research in ovarian cancer. It's probably the hottest topic of research uh, nowadays. And uh, um, shown here is uh, the possibility that uh, tumors that have a BRCA mutation can in fact acquire a second mutation, which basically knocks out the good mutation and makes these tumors uh, resistant. Another question that is very common is, can you take a PARP inhibitor after an, a PARP inhibitor? So um, there's a, a lot of interest in developing trials to answer this question. And the first trial um, addressing it was recently reported at our uh, European conference a um, couple of weeks ago. Um, this was a positive study. Uh, where uh, patients that had uh, been treated with a PARP were able to be treated again as a second maintenance after platinum. Uh, there was a small ad uh, advantage, small benefit. I believe that this benefit is relatively modest, only uh, two months. Um, so I think that this strategy is only useful for patients with platinum sensitive uh, tumors who respond to platinum again, but the benefit the second time is uh, uh, smaller than the first time. How about long exposure to PARP inhibitors, right? These are drugs that we take as maintenance, so there is no end to it. Um, and indeed in the clinical trials, you can see that uh, 22% of patients took an olaparib for more than five years, uh, showing that this drug is toler tolerated over a long period of time. Um, there are some concerns that with prolonged use of PARP inhibitors, some other hidden dangers may um, exist. And uh, in the long-term follow-up of the Olaparib study, uh, the risk of uh, myelodysplastic syndrome and leukemia um, kind of raised some attention. A higher proportion of patients, about 8%, um, um, were reported to, uh, that they could have developed uh, MDS or leukemia. And lastly, can we com uh, combine PARP inhibitors with other active drugs? Generally, combinations with chemotherapy uh, have been tried, uh, but are, have been difficult because both chemotherapy and the PARP inhibitors uh, affect the bone marrow, so you have low blood counts. But can the PARP inhibitors be combined with other drugs that don't affect the bone marrow, such as immunotherapy or uh, anti-angiogenic drugs? Um, yes, they can. Uh, this is a, a trial that uh, raised a lot of interest, uh, looking at the combination of niraparib and um, immunotherapy, pembrolizumab. Um, you can see again in this um, waterfall uh, plot, a lot of uh, patients responded, tumors are below zero. Um, and some of these responses were very long-lived. Um, and these results have actually prompted larger trials, uh, randomized trials uh, in the upfront setting, looking at immunotherapy with um, um, PARP inhibitors after standard treatment. How about uh, 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 PARP inhibitors and uh, anti-angiogenic drugs, such as bevacizumab, Avastin? Uh, yes, they can be combined, and it looks like um, they work together synergistically. Um, uh, addition of olaparib to bevacizumab uh, improved progression-free survival compared to bevacizumab alone um, in uh, this uh, trial, Paola 1 trial, uh, where this strategy was uh, attempted in the first-line treatment. Uh, and of course, the benefit was higher in patients with BRCA mutations and homologous recombination tumors. So this is a lot of material. Uh, I realize what are the uh, take home messages? PARP inhibitors are a new class of drugs, very active in ovarian cancer. We have three inhibitors that have been approved. Um, they have slight differences in indication profiles, olaparib, rucaparib, and niraparib. 
Um, they have highest activities in patients with tumors with BRCA mutations or in tumors with homologous recombination deficient tumors. Now two of them, Olaparib, uh, together with Bevacizumab and Niraparib, have been approved for use in the first line setting and um, the Recaparib study is ongoing. Um, there is a lot of research going on to understand how PARP inhibitor resistance happens and how to overcome it and how to best combine PARP inhibitors uh, with other drugs. We've all been through a, a dreadful year of the pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, we as physicians, as well as uh, US patients, I think have appreciated um, PARP, as a, PARP inhibitors as a safe option um, uh, not requiring frequent visits to the doctor, not causing a lot of immunosuppression. Um, and with that, I'd like to close. I hope I didn't go over too much. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Dr. Matei. We'll switch then to Dr. Tanner for our next discussion. I think actually Karen's going to uh, speak next because her talk kind of uh, moves into more of what uh, Dr. Matei was talking about, and I'll, I'll pop on after. Sounds great. Karen, you're still muted, it looks like. There you go. I think Dr. Matei has to close her screen before I can share. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, but I went backwards, okay. I just briefly wanna talk about side effect profiles and management strategies for PARP inhibitors. As Dr. Matei said, there are three approved PARP inhibitors for the treatment of epithelial ovarian, fallopian tube and primary peritoneal cancer in the maintenance setting or for recurrence. They are Alaparib, Niraparib, and Rucaparib. The main side effects that all PARP inhibitors cause are nausea, heartburn, vomiting, and fatigue. In the clinical trials performed, greater than 60% of all patients reported these symptoms once starting on their PARP inhibitors. All PARP inhibitors have a combined 1.5% chance of causing myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a form of leukemia, with uh, two years or three years of use. It's not the long-term studies. So that means individually, it's less than 1% for each of these drugs. So this is one of the reasons why we make you get CBCs and chemistries quite frequently while on these medications, so we can monitor closely. Each PARP inhibitor also has a unique set of side effects that we like to monitor as well. For example, Lymparza can cause pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lungs, and that can happen in 0.8% of the patient population. Niraparib can cause hypertension in 6% of its population. And rupcaparib can cause a dry red raised rash in 43% of its patient population. It also has the highest level of hepatic impairment associated with it at 29%. When starting on PARP inhibitors, we uh, generally have seen that after three or four months of continued use, side effects tend to dissipate, but it's just getting through those three to four months that we have to help you through. Uh, nausea is one of the common side effects, and most of the time patients are just not starting on PARP inhibitors right out the door. They've had taxol carbo and other treatments. So you should have your arsenal of antiemetics at home. If you don't, be sure and tell us before you start on your PARP inhibitors. Make sure you have some Ativan, Zofran, Chytral, Compazine at home. Um, if you start taking your nausea medications on a regular basis, also know that it does cause constipation and the PARP inhibitor itself can cause a low percentage of constipation. So we'll address some drugs to take for that in a little bit. Dyspepsia or heartburn, you want to take Tom's, Pepsid, Prilosec, either daily or twice daily as you need. Avoid triggering foods. 
Um, if you notice some, some PARP inhibitors, you have to take twice a day. So if you notice that right after you take your PARP inhibitor, your heart burns worse, avoid maybe drinking your coffee until later in the day if you can, or eating high acidic foods till later in the day. Fatigue. I think every drug, whether it be IV or oral, will cause fatigue, but PARP inhibitors cause a fair amount of fatigue for patients. You want to be able to take frequent naps without guilt. It's a normal side effect. Take your nap. You want to increase your exercise to help your energy level. You want to schedule important events early in the morning when you're going to have your best energy levels. And then ask for help from your support system to assist you in achieving your goals. And also, if you're working during this time, try and ask your employer to be a little flexible if you have to step away from the workplace to just regather yourself and come back to work. See if that would be fine. Constipation. Rule of thumb, never go a day without a bowel movement because then you're just playing catch up. So you always want to be sure to take a stool softener and a stool stimulant, either one to two times per day. I wish I could say that... Uh, Nausea meds and constipation meds are book, like book work, but they're not. It's kind of an experiment we're going to do with you. Everybody is different. Everybody has different reactions to their stool softeners and stimulants. But Colace is a stool softener. It pulls water into the colon. So you want to take that one to two times a day to make sure the stool is soft. And then Sunacot, Miralax, Max Citrate, those are all stimulants. So you want to take those to move the stool through the pipes to get to the exit. If you're having rock hard stools in the rectum, you might want to do um, Duclax suppository or an enema even to get the stool from the bottom out to make room for the stuff on top to come out. Um, pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lung tissue. So if you, if you start to develop a dry persistent cough, shortness of breath at rest and with activity, chest pain, please do call our office and report this to us. We're going to instruct you to stop your PARP inhibitor at that time and likely come in for a stat chest X-ray. Pneumonitis on a chest X-ray looks like inflammation. It's hazy, uh, looks like pneumonia. So if you have that, we're likely going to give you an inhaler. And if your breathing is bad enough when you present to clinic, we're going to give you oral steroids as well to take to help to decrease inflammation and help your breathing. We also may refer you to pulmonology if the symptoms are severe enough. If you start to have pneumonitis, chances are your career on this uh, PARP inhibitor might be stopped. You can challenge with other PARP inhibitors that don't have this as a side effect, but you shouldn't resume this drug at that time. Hypertension, every patient is different. You might wanna start on a low dose calcium channel blocker, or beta blocker, diuretics if appropriate. Tell them to manage the, tell the patient to manage their blood pressure one to two times at home. Try and take it when they're resting and not running after family members cooking or working um, and refer them to their internist too. let the internist know that this patient's on a PARP inhibitor and they now have hypertension and that we've started them on these antihypertensive drugs so that there's no problems after they complete their PARP inhibitor. If you get a rash from Rucaparib, generally you want to stay out of the sun because that's a uh, a big uh, promoter for this rash. And you wanna take over-the-counter steroid creams and Benadryl creams to help with inflammation and itching and redness. If this rash persists after starting those medications for 24 to 72 hours, uh, call the office please so that we can call in higher dose steroids. We can do high dose steroid creams such as 2% hydrocortisone cream, um, uh, uh, clobetis saw something like that, or even an oral taper, steroid taper to help your rash. But we also may refer you to oncodermis. They like to specialize in uh, management of side effects, skin side effects related to oral chemotherapies and immunotherapies. Persistent pancytopenia is continuous lowered white count, red count, and platelets. Patients who have this often will report being excessively fatigued. They may have um, shortness of breath, weakness. They may have easy bruising or report a rash where they have uh, purple patches on their skin with red dots. These are called petechiae, and that generally is broken blood vessels, and it means that your platelets aren't working their best. 
So do call the office if you start to have these symptoms as we'll have you come in, get a CBC in chemistry and check out what's going on. If your counts are low, we're going to tell you to hold your PARP inhibitor and test your labs weekly until they resume normal levels. If they don't resume normal levels after four to six weeks, we likely will refer you to hematology for an evaluation and workup with them to rule out any form of myelodysplastic syndrome. And as always, there are dose adjustments with PARP inhibitors that we can do to assist the patient with their tolerance of the drugs. A laparib, uh, the normal dose is 300 milligrams by mouth twice daily with or without food. If you start off renally impaired, we're going to dose reduce you right out the door to 200 milligrams by mouth twice daily. If you have intolerance to these medications, the first dose reduction will be to take you down to 250 milligrams by mouth twice daily. And then the second would be to decrease you to 200 milligrams by mouth twice daily. If you can't tolerate a laparib at that point, then we should discontinue this medication. As always, before you start this PARP inhibitor, we'd want you to get a CBC and a chemistry. And we would want you to do either every other week or weekly CBC and chemistries for a month or so, just to see your trend and make sure that you can tolerate this medication. Norapirib by far has the most rules and regulations. The normal dose starts out based on your weight and platelet count. So if your weight is less than 170 pounds and your platelet counts less than 150, the manufacturer recommends starting out dose reduced at 200 milligrams by mouth daily. If the patient weighs greater than 170 pounds and greater than 150 platelets, you can start out at 300 milligrams by mouth daily. You can take this drug with or without foods. If you have out of the um, door hepatic impairment, some uh, elevated liver enzymes, you wanna start with a dose reduced 200 milligrams by mouth daily. For persistent pancytopenia, you have to reduce by 100 milligrams each time. Your first dose reduction would be 300 milligrams to 200 milligrams by mouth daily. And your second would be from 200 milligrams to 100 milligrams by mouth daily. If you can't tolerate 100 milligrams by mouth, you have to discontinue this medication. Any grade three adverse reaction lasting greater than 28 days, you should consider discontinuing Neraparib. If your patient can resolve their grade three toxicity in less than 28 days, you may resume the drug, but by a dose reduction of 100 milligrams. So for example, if your platelet counts less than 100, you wanna hold that drug until it goes above 100. If it um, doesn't resume to greater than 100 and remains at 75,000 for greater than 28 days, you can resume Neraparib, but at 100 milligram dose reduction. If your white count is less than 1,000, your neutrophil count, I should say, and your hemoglobin is less than eight, you wanna hold the drug and test your CBC until your neutrophil count goes above 1,500 and your hemoglobin above nine. You want to resume that drug at 100 milligram dose reduction or discontinue if your neutrophils and hemoglobin do not recover in 28 days. And on Neraparib, you want to do a CBC and chemistry weekly for one month and then monthly for the remainder of the time you are on this drug. And Rucaparib, it starts out at 600 milligrams by mouth twice daily. You can take with or without food. And if you cannot tolerate this dose, you'll be dose reduced by 100 milligrams each time. And they allow you three dose reductions to 300 milligrams by mouth twice daily. If you can't tolerate that after that uh, time, then we have to discontinue this medication. And you'll do a CBC in chemistry before treatment and monthly while on Rucaparib. The not so fun part about PARP inhibitors, um, when we first prescribe them for you, we go through our specialty pharmacy and there's a reason because most insurance companies will not pay the full amount for your drug and you need patient assistance. And we have to go through our specialty pharmacies. So it may take several weeks to get the drug delivered to your house. 
It's not available commercially at Walgreens, Costco, Osco. So we bear with us when we do phone these in because monthly without any financial assistance or insurance coverage, Limparza on average will cost $14,286 per month. Naraparib is cheap at $5,650 per month. And Rucaparib is at um, the most expensive at $16,808 per month. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Karen. We'll uh, head to Dr. Tanner to wrap out the presentations for the session and then transition. We're already getting some excellent questions. Just a reminder to add those to the chat if there are things that are coming up that you'd like us to address following our talks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try to keep this uh, relatively brief so that we can get to all of your questions. Um, I'm going to take a step back. And Dr. Mate uh, and Karen gave a really great distillation of BRCA mutations and how we use that to guide therapy with PARP inhibitors for our patients with ovarian cancer. Um, you know, this is by far the most um, uh, well-developed uh, targeted therapy that we have for patients with ovarian cancer. You could make a, um, a, a fairly strong argument that it's the, the most effective and, and widely available targeted therapy for cancers uh, overall, uh, perhaps with checkpoint inhibitors. But this is, I think, important to think about more broadly as we consider where our, our uh, treatment of patients is going and thinking about molecular testing um, uh, and how BRCA fits in just as one part of that. Um, the goal with molecular testing is to characterize a patient's tumor so that we can target therapies based on this. And this is a part of precision medicine. And maybe we can find new and unexpected treatments or perhaps avoid ineffective or toxic treatments that may not be helpful. But this is, we're still very early on in this. And we've had some great successes for some patients, especially with PARP inhibitors. Um, but we have a long way to go. To do this kind of targeted uh, testing, we do need to have access to the tumor. Uh, that can be done in one of two ways. The most straightforward, and I think the one that we, we generally think of is direct tumor biopsy. Sometimes that can be from a pre-existing specimen. Sometimes that can mean going back to get an, initial bi an additional biopsy. But there is also the emerging uh, technology for, for liquid biopsy, where we, even if a tumor is not in the bloodstream, there can be protein and DNA shed from the tumor, and that can be picked up and analyzed for evaluations of treatments. And this is a, a, an even newer technique for for uh, testing. So there's a bunch of different plat platforms available for mutation testing. And I don't, we're not going to be able to, we could talk about all this, just like all the other topics we could talk about for an hour or more easily. Um, but these tests generally assess the DNA, the RNA, or other functional aspects of a tumor. We tend to have pretty good coverage for insurance for many of these tests now. Um, and I'm not making any specific endorsements for any of them, but there's there certainly are plenty of others. But I would like to kind of give you maybe some tools to help you interact with with your, with your provider about how these can be useful. So um, they're not useful for everyone yet. Even if we order them for most of our patients who may have recurrent cancers especially, um, but the ways these can, when I think about how I use these, I think of um, hereditary tumors and hereditary-like tumors, and especially the BRCA type pattern, a response, response to new targeted therapies, there are chemotherapy sensitivity assays. We won't be, have time to discuss those today. And then how can this impact clinical trial enrollment? So Dr. Matei went uh, through a lot of great details about how BRCA mutations, whether they're hereditary or found in the tumor, the somatic mutations make uh, patients' uh, tumors sensitive to PARP inhibitors. Um, this is, we see this also with other types of cancers now as well. Of course, ovary, ovary cancer has been leading the way in terms of are the options for these treatments. Um, but we see it elsewhere as well. I'm going to get to a little bit more discussion about HRD status, but this is the, the tried and true way that we've been doing um, evaluation for treatments. But there are other types of specific, specific targeted therapies, and I think of these in two broad buckets. They are targeted therapies that are independent of the, the tumor type. So there are targeted therapies for particular mutations, regardless of whether it's a lung cancer or an ovary cancer or anything, it can be used in any solid tumor. And then there are FDA approved therapies 
um, that are targeted for specific cancer types, and in this, if we're ovary cancer. So those are NTREC mutations inhibitors, um, and then uh, checkpoint inhibitors and PARP inhibitors. So um, the two independent type targeted therapies, I, I do think even though these are rare, I think this is the model for what we would hope to see down the road. So NTREC fusion mutations occur in about 2% of, of tumors in patients with adult or pediatric solid tumors. Uh, we don't actually know the exact rate in, in women with ovary cancer because it's hard to get a good denominator. We're still exploring a lot of these, um, but it's, it's probably low and similar to the overall rate in women with uh, in, uh, in solid tumors. But um, entrexinib is the uh, FDA approved NTREC inhibitor in three clinical trials independent of the tumor origin. Um, the overall response rate was 79%, and the responses were quite long in responders. The average was 35 months, so almost three years, which is great, and the treatments were pretty well tolerated. So this is, I wish we had more treatments like this. Um, Entric mut fusion mutations are now standard in terms of um, uh, most of the next generation sequencing platforms and are tested, but it's only 2% of women with ovary cancer. We need lots more things like this and, and things, mutations that are more common. Um, then the next one that is approved um, for independent of the tumor type are patients with DNA mismatch repair deficiencies, MSI high tumors or high tumor mutational burden. We see this in about 2% of women with ovarian cancers. Although in women with non-serous histologies, the rate is higher. It could be up to 20% in some types of endometrioid ovarian cancers. And so there are some certain subgroups of patients that may have a higher chance of, of benefiting from these treatments, but the, the treatments for this are checkpoint inhibitors, specifically pembrolizumab in a basket study where they took um, patients with lots of different types of tumors that had these deficiencies. Uh, the overall response rate was 29%. It's not as good as the NTREC inhibitors, but in patients that responded, the their response, responses tend to be robust. So more than half a patient responded patients responded for more than a year, often heavily pretreated patients who had received lots of therapies before. So that's exciting. And these treatments are generally pretty well tolerated, although there are rare serious side effects that go along with checkpoint inhibitors. There are other situations where we use uh, checkpoint inhibitors based on uh, other markers that are more disease specific. So PD-1 status for cervix cancer was just approved last week. Uh, for combination with chemotherapy. And in gastric and lung cancers, we have that indication, but it doesn't seem to be effective uh, based on PD-1 status for ovarian cancer. And some of the work done by Dr. Matei and others trying to look at other ways to increase the immune, the immunogenicity of ovarian cancer tumors so that things like checkpoint inhibitors may be effective is something that, that we're excited to see. Um, I do think that it's good to look at other um, so it, we do have one other uh, ovary specific um, indication where there's a targeted therapy. And I, I won't go into this too much because Dr. Matei went in, into it in a lot of detail with patients with BRCA mutations. But in essence, um, rather than looking for the cause of the problem, which is looking at BRCA mutations, right? And seeing that that leads to uh, inability to repair DNA damage and then sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. We could look at the outcome of that. So if you if a, a tumor can't repair DNA damage, it's going to accumulate lots of large genome rearrangements. And that the phenotype, the way those those tumors appear is can can be described as homologous recombination deficiency. And so that's the effect of that we can look for, and that can also help us determine sensitivity to PARP inhibitors. So half of all women with advanced ovary cancer have homologous recombination deficiency, but only 20% will have a, a BRCA or a BRCA-like mutation. Another 30% will have homologous recombination deficiency by some other mechanism. We can look for that effect even if there's no BRCA mutation. So this gets to that trial that, that Dr. Matei mentioned, the Palo one trial that looked at women with receiving first-line chemotherapy with bevacizumab who were planning to get bevacizumab maintenance. They were randomized either olaparib for two years or placebo. And then the subgroup of women who had homologous recombination deficiency, the time to progression on average was 37 months versus 17 months. So that's pretty impressive. And that led to indication for um, the combination of lab with 
Edwick Bevis's map for maintenance therapy in patients with H HRD um, status, even if they don't have a BRCA mutation. So we need more things like this. And what is the, how do we, how do we figure that out? How do we find new options? So um, uh, we can look to other disease sites for uh, kind of a playbook to do this. So HER2 is uh, positive in breast cancers and uterine cancers, certain types of uterine cancers, and we can use trastuzumab in combination with chemotherapy. We use MEK inhibitors for certain types of melanoma and lung cancers that have BRAF and MEK mutations. We actually do use this for patients with low-grade serous ovary cancer quite effectively, regardless of mutation status. And there's other areas um, looking at lung cancer with EGFR, uh, TKI inhibitors um, for non-small cell lung cancer, and lots of other ways that we can use targeted therapies based on mutation status. Um, there are some promising new approaches for over ovary cancer where we might have some marker-driven therapies. So HDAC inhibitors, which are currently only approved for cutaneous T-cell lymphomas, um, may, may be effective for certain types of mutations, patients with P53 mutations or ARID1A mutations that we see in clear cell carcinoma. Uh, we1 inhibitors, which seem to have some correlation with response in patients with P53 positive tumors, especially we see this in P53 mutations in patients with high-grade serous ovary cancers. There was a, uh, a trial presented this year that combined gemcitabine, which is one of our standard chemo drugs, with a we one inhibitor and showed improved responses. So there's a lot more things being tested and there's no way we can go through all those in detail. And, but I, I, what I would like to leave you with is that um, this is a, a chart of patients with specific mutations with different types of ovary cancer and what kinds of mutations were found. You can see that there's certainly on the far left and far right, right there are certain mutations that we see in, in in ovarian cancer tumors that may be targetable, but a lot of mutations occur in only a small percentage of patients. And it's gonna take, unfortunately, a lot of time for us to hopefully one day find specific mutations that we can target. And each patient may have one or two different things that we may be able to put together that may find more, hopefully, uh, home run type, type options. Um, similar to you know, the NTREC inhibitors or the way we are seeing in some patients with, with PARP inhibitors, but we still have a ways to go. So just to leave you with um, um, how you may be able to um, uh, use this, uh, this may help determine eligibility for trials, either disease-specific trials or general trials based on mutation. These are oftentimes early phase trials, but next generation sequencing reports can oftentimes give you information about um, trials and uh, at the time the test was ordered, but they may not be updated. So, and you may need to travel for trials, which can be an additional factor. So how can you use this? Ask your doctor about tumor testing. Uh, what kind of tumor testing would be appropriate for you? Is there tissue still available? Sometimes there's not. If not, would a biopsy be possible? Is it safe to do that? And if not, is a liquid biopsy appropriate? That's something that's coming along. And then are clinical trials available based on the results? So if you're asking your doctor about clinical trials, um, make sure to re-ask because sometimes mutations, there may not be a trial available immediately, but then a year later, there might be something available. You can actually also do this yourself. If you know that you have a particular mutation in tumor, you can get on clinicaltrials.gov and see if there's any, any uh, marker-driven trials available. And hopefully you shouldn't have to do that yourself, but it is one way that you can look for other trials that would be available. So hopefully those are some tools that that people might find helpful. I know that was fast. We're, I wanna make sure that we leave time for questions from everyone. So um, uh, I'm gonna stop there and, and we'll uh, hopefully get some time to answer your questions as well. Thank you so much to our excellent presenters. That was wonderful. Um, I think we'll kick it off with the first question that was asked. Um, and Dr. Tanner, I think maybe you'd be a good one to answer this. The, the question was, um, is there such a thing as being cured of ovarian cancer? And kind of further going to that, is there a length of time that if a patient passes that time, she could be considered that she's cured of her cancer? Yeah, and I think even um, uh, Vicky's question, lower down asking about like, do, does a chance of cure increase with time? So the way I generally think of this with patients is that um, like, the further you get out from diagnosis, um, especially when someone gets more than three years, but especially five years out from primary treatment, if they've never recurred, the chance of a recurrence decreases dramatically. Um, there, of course, there are 
cases of patients who have recurred many years out from a diagnosis of ovarian cancer, but the, the likelihood of a recurrence happening more than five years out from diagnosis, if someone has really is disease free and has never recurred, it really does start to decrease significantly. So the and, and when we look at some of the data, like some of the data that Dr. Mate presented looking at PARP inhibitors, looking at patients who are now five years out um, and still disease free, we don't totally know the answer about those questions with new therapies. But I do think that effectively for patients that get five years and more out, um, whether or not there's any chance of recurrence, I think is, is one question is, very low chances of recurrence past five years. I do think that there is the question of whether intensive interventions like CT scans and things like that should be done as part of follow-up for patients past five years. Understanding that, you know, I think that there are patients and it's different for, for some patients versus others, but you know, coming to the oncologist can be a very um, traumatizing experience. I know there's, there's patients who have PTSD from their cancer experience and, and they may not benefit from coming in um, many years after. It's some, I think for some patients, it can be triggering to come in to the oncologist. And, and there, there's, that's a discussion that we tend to have in terms of whether, whether there's a benefit to con continuing to follow up when the risk of recurrence decreases. Um, you know, past five years. So, which, so it's a very individualized uh, question, but there are patients that are cured. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more just coming in here. Maybe Dr. Mate, could you field, um, what about immune therapy for ovarian cancer? I was glad I didn't get that subject for today. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, immune therapy, unfortunately, uh, for ovarian cancer has not lived up to its promise, or at least not immunotherapy in current form. Uh, we, we're thinking about immune checkpoint inhibitors when we're saying immunotherapy. Uh, the response rates to immunotherapy in ovarian cancer to single agent immune checkpoint inhibitors is somewhere around 10% as a single agent. Um, and that's across multiple types of um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. There's a big debate as to why that is. Strangely, endometrial cancer that um, is somewhat similar to ovarian cancer has a better uh, response rate than um, uh, ovarian cancer. I think we have to uh, probably uh, think about um, strategic combinations with immunotherapy, putting together immunotherapy with maybe anti-angiogenic drugs, or maybe with uh, drugs that inhibit some of the um, suppressive cells uh, in the um, uh, microenvironment of the tumor, ovarian tumors. It is believed that uh, this peritoneal space where ovarian cancer metastasizes, it's infiltrated by cells that um, make the immune cells not respond. So you have to knock out those suppressive cells. And there are a lot of clinical trials ongoing. There's also a lot of interest in uh, doing, you know, uh, CAR T cells. These are engineered uh, T cells specifically to attack um, uh, ovarian cancer. And those might be interesting, you know, down the line, we're waiting for results. Uh, of some of those trials, but I always encourage my patients to participate um, in trials of CAR T cells or combination immunotherapy. Straight up immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work and immune checkpoint inhibitors with chemotherapy also don't work. We saw two clinical trials that were reported this year that were both negative. But I believe that um, combinations might, uh, might uh, work and there's a lot, a lot of research uh, in that area. That's great. Um, here's another question, maybe Karen, you could feel this. Past chemotherapy, what's the best way to get a leg up from a recurrence if you're not on a PARP inhibitor? For recurrence, you said, I'm sorry? Yeah. Monitoring your symptoms, if any new symptom develops over a two week period of time, like changes in your bowel or bladder pattern, worsening nausea, vomiting, weight loss, dry persistent cough, headache, if your family notices you're not acting your normal self, 
call the office and let us know so that we can, you know, triage you over the phone and likely have you come in for an earlier exam. Better, better to be safe than sorry and have you come in for an exam or a pelvic exam first and then um, go from there. But be cognizant of your personal symptoms of your new normal after you finish your chemotherapy and moving forward. Um, Dr. Mate, maybe this one can be for you. As a physician, what can you do other than routine blood tests to evaluate patients for delayed hematologic toxicities re related to the increased risk of MDS and AML? Yeah, you cannot do anything else, unfortunately. And we don't know, we cannot predict those patients who are at higher risk. Um, when I mentioned that risk of 8% for the long-term users, that's, uh, I think that's just like the long-term follow-up of, of, of the studies. And many people believe that, in fact, the, the inciting event for the leukemia and MDS is not the PARP inhibitor, but rather the chemotherapy that was given before because carboplatin can cause leukemia. So the more chemotherapy one has, you know, that risk increases. And now with the PARP inhibitors, you know, we are prolonging life. Uh, so we have longer time to observe these things that otherwise maybe would have not surfaced, you know, late events after chemotherapy. Um, if patients didn't survive the ovarian cancer, we know, would have never had the uh, time to observe this, but it's something that we watch for. Uh, sometimes the shape of the red cells changes, they become larger. Uh, and interestingly, the PARP inhibitors make the cells, that MCV that shows up in your CBC, uh, it's almost universally larger uh, when patients take PARP inhibitors. So there are some things that we watch for, but we don't, we have no way of predicting. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a, it's a really great point because we're really looking for like the kind of the slower like anemia and platelets that are not the, like when we're doing the follow-up, it's, it's really looking for symptomatic uh, like response to the, in the bone marrow to the drug, not MDS and AML, which is that that's, you know, unfortunately we're not really good at, at, at identifying that. Um, we are down to our last minute and a half here, so we will sneak in one last question. Just knowing that some of the PARP inhibitors can cause renal impairment, would this treatment be safe in someone who has insulin-dependent diabetes, who has overall relatively good renal function? Yeah, I would say so, and monitoring the kidney function um, and making sure that patients keep hydration. And sometimes we switch from one uh, PARP inhibitor to another depending on, um, you know, on creatinine level. Well, I will help have us wrap up here since we're just about to get pushed back out of our breakout room. But thank you everyone for uh, coming to this session. Thank you so much to our presenters and uh, just thanks in general for attending this wonderful event today. We really appreciate having you all here.